Uh, my name is Peter Ersch. I'm a thermal engineer with Siena, um, as is my colleague, Bezad Mohadjer. Uh, Siena is uh, a producer of optical networking gear. Um, some things that we're very good at are long haul coherent transceivers, uh, packet and OTN switching, and data center interconnect. What I'd like to talk to you today about is the um, work that my very talented colleagues and I have done to develop a migration path from an all air-cooled system to a liquid-cooled system without redesigning the equipment from the ground up. Now today when I talk about liquid cooling, what I do mean in this context is hybrid liquid air cooling. We keep the fans on, run them at low speed and quietly to cool the multitude of lower power devices riddled throughout the system. We're also going to talk about um, a prototype of our next next-gen pluggable optical module. Why liquid cool? I hope the story is just being hit home throughout this conference. Um, a key thing is that it provides competitive lower cost communication. Um, it, when you deploy air cooled equipment into a facility and dump that heat into the air of the room, there is a very big facility cost to remove that heat. Um, if that same equipment is converted to liquid cooled, the facility cooling cost drops dramatically. It could be by about two thirds. Very rough numbers. We could review it offline. Other advantages are that the fans in the system can go down in speed and consume much less power. The IT equipment itself can draw less power because it's running cooler. The fans run quietly. And on the performance side, what the liquid cooling does is, is unleash the potential to cool much higher power um, packet switching ASICs, for example, next gen ASICs, and next gen higher power pluggable optical modules. This is our system fluid network. I hope also that this one is something that everyone is getting comfortable with. We've got three parts. On the left is the secondary coolant loop, circulating coolant through the, through the Sienna coherent router. The fluid is delivered to uh, manifolds at the rear of our equipment. The manifolds further distribute the flow to cold plates within the router module. The, the coolant picks up the heat, exits the system through a return side manifold, and goes to the cooling distribution unit, which is the second piece of this in the middle. The cooling distribution unit does many things, a couple of key things that it does, it serves as the pump for the secondary coolant loop. It also provides the heat transfer from the secondary coolant loop into the facility water system. The facility water system is the third part. Um, this is not the Sienna side of things, but we need to understand it and understand what temperatures are involved and what flow rates are involved. The facility water system provides the cold source, or in some cases, a not so cold source for all of this heat. The heat dumps into the facility water system where it's then, for example, uh, carried up to the facility roof, to a, a rooftop chiller, um, where the heat is then liberated into the environment or repurposed if we get more clever about where all the energy goes. I'm zooming in now to the CN equipment. This is our coherent router. Um, I'm showing a chassis on the left. Uh, the chassis, two of these chassis can fit into one rack. Uh, I think providing a 128 terabits per second of packet switching. Um, I'm showing two router modules of 13 possible modules that can insert into the rack. The modules, from the user's perspective, plug in and extract normally. The user doesn't need to think about anything. But what's happening at the rear of the module is that we're simultaneously making an electrical connection and a, a fluid connection. The fluid connection is done through a pair of blind mate quick disconnects. These quick disconnects are floating to accommodate mechanical tolerances. Um, they provide flow to the details on the router. On the right half of the slide, you'll see a stripped down version where I'm showing only the, the liquid cooling elements. So you can see the rack manifold, the vertical pieces. There's a supply side and a return side. And at every level associated with every router in the system is a pair of quick disconnects. They're blind mate, 
latchless, drip-free, highly reliable. And a number of vendors do these. Now I'm zooming into the rotor module itself. In the middle is, is a, a real picture of our converted module. Um, it started as an air-cooled module with a very large, expensive um, vapor chamber heat sink to affect the cooling that we needed. Um, there were also a, a v an array of heat sinks on all the plug pluggable optical modules. We stripped out those air-cooled heat sinks. And within that same envelope, and with, while using the existing mounting points on the system, we attached a liquid cooling harness into the same space. The liquid cooling harness, and you can see in the middle picture, there's a pair of quick disconnects at the back that picks up the, the fluid supply and return from the manifolds. The fluid is distributed through cold plates on the module. Um, a number of cold plates. One is the ASIC cold plate, as you see on the left. The ASIC cold plate is a microchannel, custom microchannel cold plate. Um, it attaches with sprung contact onto our packet switching ASIC with a thermal interface in between. Also throughout the system, we're cooling pluggable optical modules. And to be more specific, we're providing coolant to liquid cold plates, low profile liquid cold plates, as you see on the right side, um, which sit on top of each one of the pluggable, pluggable optical modules. These are sprung down and floating, riding cold plates. And what that means is when you plug in one of those modules, the cold plate self-levels to make cold planar contact, and the sprung down contact gives us a good thermal interface between those surfaces. This is the heart of the conversion. Um, we started with an air-cooled wave router platform. Airflow was into the inlet, out the exhaust at the back. And what you see on the left is the wall of fans that we have at the rear of the equipment. What we did is take one column of fans, strip it out of the system. And within that envelope, and using ex existing mounting points, we put in the manifold that I've talked about before. Um, it provides the connection to the CDU on the rear-facing side and all the blind mate connections to our router modules on the front facing side. The fans turn down in speed, so now they're consuming less power, as I mentioned earlier, and running quietly. Otherwise, when those are running full speed, you do not want to be behind this equipment, it's loud and windy. So we have liquid targeting the critical devices on the system, and air cooling everything else that still needs some convective heat transfer. That's our hybrid system and our conversion to it. Now I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Bezad, who's going to talk about thermal performance as well as the next-gen pluggable optical module. Thanks, Peter. I start with the ASIC and the cooling capability of the ASIC, ASIC cold plate. Right now, we are air cooling. We are cooling up to 800 watts in a single device using air cool techniques. Anything above that is highly challenging, and they require highly complex, costly heat sinks that occupy a big portion of the available real estate on the board. The cooling capability of the liquid cooled part de depends on the coolant temperature, and the coolant temperature depends on the facilities water available in the building. Facilities water temperature is defined by ash rate classes. We have four different ash rate classes, class one at 17 degrees C up to class, five, class four at 45 degrees C, which is quite aggressive. If we have facilities water at class 4, 45 degrees C, we can cool up to 1,500 watts using the, the cold plate. And if we have facilities water class 1, we can cool up to 2,300 watts using the cold plate that we showed earlier. Moving to pluggable optical modules, right now we are cooling about 25 watts using air cool techniques. Anything above that is really challenging using air cool technology or air cooling using the low profile floating cold plate that we showed earlier. Uh, if depending on facilities water, we can cool between 33 watts to 55 watts uh, within this pluggable optical modules. Next, I'd like to focus a little bit more on pluggable optical modules and the thermal challenges associated with them. 
these pluggable optical modules are basically the same size as, as, as a finger, like, or a fat finger, let's say. And what they do, they are the interface between optical signal and electrical signal. But over time, more and more functionality were added to these pluggable optical modules, including digital signal processing, amplific amplifications, and stuff like that. So the pro projection for 2025 is to have 1.6 terabit coherent optical modules that can consume up to 40 watts of power. To put it into perspective, comparing to 10 years ago, that's a 40x increase in the bandwidth and 10x increase in the power consumption. And we can imagine, like, this trend is not going to stop here. At, as time goes on, more and more functionality will be added to these small form factor pluggable optical modules, and as a result, the power consumption goes up. The way that we conventionally cool these plugs is using a riding air-cooled heatsink that is spring-loaded to a cage. When a pluggable module is inserted into the host card, there is a dry sliding interface between the heatsink and the, and, and the pluggable module. That, that thermal penalty introduces a, a, a big, that, that dry interface introduces a big thermal penalty which is proportional to the power of the plug. Uh, to, to address uh, these challenges, the dry interface and also the, the cooling limitation of air cooling, what we propose here, or what we developed actually, is a solution to integrate liquid cooling within the uh, body of pluggable optical modules. To do that, we replace the case top of a pluggable optical modules with a cold plate featuring two small size blind mate quick disconnect. And the way that it works is when a pluggable module is inserted in, the electrical connection is mated at the back, and at the same time, the liquid connection is mated and liquid goes inside the uh, cold plate. This way, there is no need for an external heat sink or external cold plate. And so we, we got rid of the thermal, uh, the thermal uh, that dry interface entirely, and we are taking advantage of the superior thermal properties of liquids. In terms of thermal performance, we can cool between 55 watts and 85 watts using this solution. And here, just a summary of what we discussed about today. Uh, we introduced how we showed how we upgraded a fully air-cooled system into a hybrid system. We got, now we have the ability to use higher power plugs, higher power ASICs, a significant reduction in fan power consumption and fan noise level, and also a, a significant reduction in facility power consumption. And at the end, uh, we introduced a method to bring liquid directly into the body of a small form factor pluggable optical modules. With that, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to invite you to join us with, uh, for the poster display outside of this room, and we can have a conversation and discussion there. Thank you very much. So while our next speaker is going to prepare, uh, do we have one question, one quick question to Sienna? Could you compare your approach to pure immersion cooling? In terms of performance? Well, that's a big question. That's actually a good question. But it's, it depends. It boils down to infrastructure, if the infrastructure is available and if it's doable. Uh, we chose this because we thought that this, this would be a middle step to get to a bigger, maybe emergent cooling in the future. But to the beginning, like to start with, we think that the hybrid system, hybrid liquid air system is good, at least for the optical networking equipment. That's one thing. The other challenge with emergent is we are not 100% sure how the optics behave in an emergent domain. And that's another challenge. There needs to be a lot of testing to figure out the correlation that how these optics will behave in an emergent when, when the ambient is different. So that's the big challenge for optical networking for immersion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.